the appreciation and apprehension for the dangers faced by our environment growing on a worldwide basis, here is a new term for you to consider. Localitarianism. Localitarianism. It goes one better than organic. It refers to a growing number of people who aspire to a seasonal, local-grown diet. And we all know just how good a tomato that you buy at a roadside stand, a fresh peach, some of that great late summer corn, how good all that tastes. Fruit and vegetable grown closer to the home are more nutritious because the produce spends less time between the farm and the table. It's also more likely that they're going to be picked at the peak of their ripeness. So the story goes that one day James McKinnon and his partner Elisa Smith made a wonderful meal entirely of local ingredients in their northern BC cabin and began to wonder why they couldn't do the same thing in their home in Vancouver. And so one thing leads to another that gave birth to a book and an invitation for James McKinnon to come up here and speak to us all. Where's James? Oh, here he is. Well, I hope not too many of you saw me just scarfing the uh, pineapple fruit salad out front, but <laughs> hadn't, hadn't had any of that for a while. Now, I, I have the peculiar honor of having been invited here on the basis of the oldest imaginable idea, um, eating locally. I mean, it's something that we've, we've done pretty well, pretty naturally, since we were about, you know, organisms sort of like those yeast cells we saw dividing a couple of, uh, couple of days ago in a session. And the only way that this idea can be considered new, or the only way that it has become new again, is because uh, we've reached this extraordinary point in history where a large number of people, the majority of people in the wealthiest countries in the world, are no longer actually drawing their sustenance from the landscape that they live in and, and, and the, uh, the area that surrounds them, but rather are bringing it in from these extraordinary distances, the majority of our food coming in from all of these different points around the world. In Canada, um, the figure for even something as simple as a carrot is typically traveling about 4,000 kilometers from farm to plate. Um, that's like the distance, that's essentially crossing the continent, or uh, one comparison I like is the distance between London, England, and the capital city of Azerbaijan. So we're talking about these extraordinary distances, completely different cultures. And uh, as Moses was saying, Elisa, my partner Elisa Smith and I decided to confront this with, with uh, this attempt to eat only food raised uh, or grown within a 100-mile radius for one full year. And we call this the 100-mile diet, obviously enough, I guess. Um, that's ended up being the title of the book. And uh, although in the, in the United States, actually, it, it has a different title. It's called Plenty. And that's because the publishers in the United States said, well, if we put the word diet in the title, uh, it's going to get filed in the bookstores alongside the collected works of Suzanne Summers. <laughs> and given the fact that in our part of the world, we couldn't find any cooking oil, so we had to cook entirely with butter. Um, maybe, maybe not the best weight loss program. <laughs> I actually don't want to talk too much about the 100-mile the diet today. What I want to talk about is uh, we considered the 100-mile diet to be a thought experiment, and I want to talk about one of the pathways of thought that it, that it led us down that I thought was interesting. But I should give you some flavor for how it went. Uh, one of the things that we couldn't find in our area was wheat, and uh, this was an interesting process for us. We started out with this naive belief that because wheat is in so many foods, it must also grow everywhere, then discovered that wasn't the case in Vancouver. Um, and then we went through this phase of saying, well, it must, just, it must just be that it can't grow in a wet environment like we have on the Pacific coast. And that wasn't right. Uh, we looked into the history of it, and in fact, wheat grows very well on the Pacific coast. It's, uh, there were dozens of varieties of wheat grown there at one point. And 
at, uh, say, 100 years ago, some portions of the Pacific Northwest would actually have been wholly self-sufficient in wheat and, and in other grains. So it's really just economic specialization, industrialization that has pushed wheat off of that landscape, which was all very interesting but didn't get us any closer to having uh, pancakes and bread and pasta and crackers and cookies and, you know, the, the endless list of, of delicious foods that, uh, that come with wheat. So one day, Elisa walked into the... Uh, into, I was standing, I do all the cooking in the house, and she came into the kitchen, and uh, she had the look in her eye that she, she has when she wanted to remind me that, that the 100-mile idea had originally been, been my stupid idea. <laughs> <coughs> and she said, I am dying for a sandwich. Um, actually, what she said was, I would kill for a sandwich. Which <coughs> There's a subtle difference there, I think. <laughs> and uh, so I scrambled off into the back, and uh, a half an hour later, I said, I, I, I will make you a sandwich. And I scrambled into the back, and I came out half an hour later, and I had what appeared, I think, in every way to be a sandwich, right down to a, a deli toothpick stuck in the top with one of those little red frazzles. And uh, inside, it was layered. It had goat cheese. It had roasted red peppers. It had spinach. And then the, the two slabs of, of bread... <clears throat> were two slabs of grilled turnip. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was delicious. Uh, more importantly, it saved the relationship. <laughs> and, uh, and on it went. But not all of our difficulties were quite as, uh, as light. We also couldn't find salmon. Uh, now, this was surprising. Um, we live in Vancouver. Vancouver is at the mouth of the Fraser River one of the greatest salmon-producing rivers uh, anywhere, and yet we couldn't find salmon. So what had happened was the, the salmon fishery was, was shut down in that year. Uh, seven different species of salmon running up the river, none of them in numbers sufficient to open the fishery. Uh, they've been systematically overfished for more than a century. Uh, now they face all kinds of other environmental challenges reaching their spawning grounds, Fraser River salmon were out, so we said, okay, we'll, we'll break out rod and reel, and we will uh, catch a salmon in the Chequemus River, which runs north of Vancouver. And then a train derailed in the Chequemus River Canyon. It dumped 41,000 liters of caustic soda into the Chequemus, reduced it to a linear dead zone right down to the river mouth. We weren't going to get any salmon from the Chequemus River. So for most people in Vancouver, none of this was, was coming up on the radar all that much. I mean, if you went to the fish shop, the salmon was still there. It was just coming from far away. It was coming from Alaska or the Queen Charlotte Islands. Uh, some of it was farmed salmon coming from places like Scotland or, or even farmed salmon from B.C. Um, the, what we ended up, you know, for us, what it was was, was this kind of a soul shock. I mean... Because of this esoteric experiment we were engaging in, we really felt the loss of that salmon, and we really could recognize this enormous disconnect that's grown between ourselves and living in these places and our sense of stewardship over the landscapes that we live in. And that was a moment of choice for me. Um, I think my normal routine would have been to, to look at this bleak situation and sort of project into an even bleaker future, potentially. And then... Uh, I don't know, stagger off and try and find some local herbal antidepressants. <laughs> <coughs> um, but the 100-mile uh, the diet had been this re weirdly kind of positive, empowering thought experiment, and I think it was actually retooling my brain for optimism, which is not my normal operating state. And so instead of looking into that bleak future, I actually looked back. Uh, I turned and I thought, I'm going to look into the past this time. So I started researching the, the history of the salmon stocks. And what I found was absolutely astonishing to me. For example, a study that came out in the year 2000 said that, uh, that the fish biomass of when, when salmon were at their historical peak, the fish biomass, so the actual weight of living fish, was 93 to 94% higher than it is today. So trying to imagine, though, I, I couldn't really imagine that, so I went back into pioneer accounts and things like that, and I found uh, references to 
I mean, for example, there's a creek in British Columbia named Catch Him With Your Hands Creek. Um, there's a story, I found a letter to a government official from the early history of BC, a settler on the Fraser River, lower Fraser River, complaining that there were so many salmon in the river that when he took his canoe out, it, the water being splashed by the salmon threatened to swamp his canoe. And couldn't the government do something about all of these salmon? Um, I think it's safe to say they did do something. Uh, and I continued from there. I started looking into the, what's called the Salish Sea now, uh, or some people are calling the Salish Sea, which is this area bounded by Vancouver Island and, and the BC mainland and sort of Puget Sound and Seattle to the south. By some estimates, the Salish Sea once had 10 times the biomass of fish that it has today. And as one example of that, uh, that I think gives a sense of it, there were once 600 resident humpback whales in the Salish Sea. So if you th we think about it, it's a fairly small water body comparatively, and it had to have this incredible ecological wealth to sustain 600 humpback whales, resident. Uh, there are no humpback whales in the Salish Sea today, and there haven't been, haven't been for decades and decades. So I eventually realized that what I, what I was dabbling in actually had a name. It was called ecological history. Um, oddly enough, this, this sort of discipline of, of examining what our environments looked like in the past is, is quite new. The term ecological history is really only about uh, 30 years old, and, and very few areas have um, much ecological history recorded. One of the key concepts that's come out of ecological history so far is something called the double disappearance. So if we take the example of the whales, we've lost the whales from the Salish Sea, we also have lost the memory that there ever were whales in the Salish Sea. So that's the double disappearance of ecological history. And uh, off I went to, uh, I decided to pay a visit to my local ecological historian. That's Dr., in my case, I went to Dr. Richard Hebda, who's a paleobotanist with the Royal BC Museum. And uh, I sat down and I said, okay, uh, I've been reading about this past ecology. Now, if I, look at, if I look at nature now, what am I seeing? And he said, well, you're, you're seeing nature. You're seeing a functioning ecosystem, uh, functioning ecosystems, but they're skeletal. And because all we know now when we look at nature is the skeletal form of it, we don't recognize how close it may be to perishing. I thought this was a, an interesting point, if, if a major bummer. And uh, so I thought, let's put some flesh on those bones. And I uh, started looking into, you know, deeper into the ecological history, into the pre-Columbian ecological history. And I stumbled on this book by Tim Flannery. It's called Eternal Frontier. And uh, Tim Flannery is well known as the author of The Weather Makers. And Eternal Frontier is at least as important a book, I think. It's, it just came out in the 2000s, 2002, something like that. And it's the first overview ecological history of North America that's ever been produced. And what he captures is this uh, unbelievable pre-human abundance on the continent. We heard uh, just the other day about the, the wild horses. Uh, there were also the largest bear ever known the largest uh, bison, the largest moose, um, different species, all of these different species, a giant ground sloth. There were, in a climate not greatly different from ours today, there were lions and cheetahs, uh, jaguars. There were mastodons and, and mammoths in numbers that, that some people think were comparable to uh, the numbers of African elephants you can find in their prime habitats in, say, the Serengeti. So that would be uh, nine or ten animals per square mile in their, in their habitats. So imagine this, this unbelievably complex, uh, super abundant environment. And uh, in fact, it's getting to the point that uh, uh, some entirely credible scientists, I mean, there, there's controversy even about the idea of reintroducing you know, wolves from Canada into Yellowstone National Park in the United States and things like that. But there are now actually um, entirely credible scientists who are saying maybe in a, in a small, you know, experimental way, we need to be trying to reintroduce African lions and African elephants to North American landscapes to see if we can start to get some flavor of or to start to rebuild 
these, uh, these lost, more complex eco uh, ecosystems. Where did this idea push me eventually? It pushed me towards uh, away from the way that, that current environment, env environmentalism is moving, which is uh, towards conservation. And con conservation is clearly important. I mean, but this pattern of sort of grabbing onto the last this, the last patch of tropical forest, the last patch of, of uh, the last whole intact watershed in a, in a temperate rainforest zone. Um, it's obviously critical that we do this. But ecological history pushed me away from conservation and towards restoration. And I think this is the, the more critical um, concept. And it links back to food for me, ultimately. Um, one thing I encountered as we were working up the book, The, the 100 Mile Diet, was we just kept running into this uh, statistics. You know, the, the statistics around this stuff are, are always unbelievably depressing. But um, the statistics from the United Nations saying we only have X amount of arable land and it's being run under at such and such rate and we're losing it and you know, cities like Toronto are sprawling out over their food land. And uh, I suddenly realized that that's, that's you know, almost not even the point. The point is that the whole planet is arable. There was a time, and I think indigenous tradition um, still points to this, when we knew that we could draw food off every inch of the planet. The whole planet is arable to us. It can, all of it can feed us and sustain us. It's just a matter of restoring that ecological wealth that was once there and has been lost. So Wendell Berry, uh, who many of you have heard of, I'm sure, he's a, he's a, a well-known farmer and uh, writer and philosopher in the United States. He, uh, he once famous, famously said that eating is an agricultural act. And he wanted to remind people that this mysterious food that appears from nowhere on your plate is actually linked to uh, people who produce it and landscapes that produce it. And I certainly wouldn't disagree with, with Wendell Berry, but I would go farther. I would say that eating is an ecological act. It, uh, it's the one thing we do that constantly reconnects us or can reconnect us with the idea that we really are still sustained, still, still sustained, still brought to life by the planet that we live on. And it shapes the way we see nature as well. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The last time Alisa and I were in Toronto, we were on a, a call-in radio show. And uh, this is, uh, we, we appear on the show and people call in with questions about how to eat locally. The f number one question, by the way, is uh, how did you live for one year with no coffee? Uh, there is no easy answer to that question. <laughs> uh, but this caller came in with an interesting question. He kind of challenged us. He said, he said, well, it's well and good for you to eat locally out in Vancouver where you have all of this fish and all of this seafood. And what am I supposed to do? I live in Toronto. Um, I didn't have any clever answer for that either. And I wandered back to my hotel and was still thinking about this. And it was a day like this, and I opened up the curtains, and I went, ah, oh, the Great Lakes, <laughs> and, uh, which I may not have noticed otherwise. <laughs> um, the, and this was the thing. I, I, then I immediately jumped on my computer, and I did some research, and lo and behold, the Great Lakes did actually used to be full of fish. Uh, 35 different edible species were once drawn from the Great Lakes. Uh, incidentally, the replacement of native species by non-native species in the Great Lakes is now above the 90% level. But 35 uh, edible species of fish, not even including the shellfish, were once drawn from the Great Lakes. There, it's, it uh, supported a substantial commercial fishery. And there are, again, settlers' accounts. People talk about the Great Lakes fishing style, which was to grab an axe handle, walk down to the lake, and beat the surface of the water till a couple of fish floated up and uh, take those back and put them on the skillet. So there was this kind of abundance that we talked about. And I thought, here is the double disappearance, again, you know, in, in, in its most uh, aggressive form. So not only have we lost the fish, we've lost even the capacity to believe that those lakes could once have sustained us with the food they could provide. And so I want to leave you, I think, with, 
with a challenge, and that is if you're, if you're from out of town, uh, even if you're from Toronto, try to make uh, a trip down to that lakefront, that, that sort of shunned and ignored lakefront, and stand there and look out at the water and try to imagine it with that past abundance. Try to imagine it with 10 times the fish biomass that it has uh, today. So what would that look like? I mean, would there be uh, large fish driving small fish to the surface? Um, imagine the bird life that would be coming down to feed. Imagine the, the small fish um, spawning in shoals against the shore. Uh, imagine outside of the city, the number of animals that would be able to come down and feed from that, that huge basin. Because this, uh, I think this is our challenge. More than, more than hanging on to these, these last scraps and these islands of nature, what we need to do is reimagine nature. More than that, we need to remember the natural world. And I think, uh, I think that when we do, we'll find that it's a much more optimistic process. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>